ahead of our New County Kingdom Sessions Live, the amazing Zoe got a chance to sit down with one of our special guests, Caroline Lloyd, healthcare professional and occupational therapist, to talk a little bit more about herself and how she releases God's kingdom in and through her workplace. It's packed full of wisdom and insight, so I hope you enjoy. Okay, so hi guys, um, thanks for watching. As you already know, we are doing the New Kind of Kingdom Sessions Live yeah. on the 12th of May. And with me today, I have the wonderful Caroline Lloyd. Hi, hi. Yeah. <laughs> hi, so um, we're just going to do a little interview with you so that they can get to know you better. So if you want to start off, you can just tell us a bit about yourself, like where you're from, your job, your family. Hi, yeah, so some of you might know me, but I'm probably new to most of you. Um, my name's Caroline. I'm married to Colin. Um, he's a teacher and I've got two teenage girls that are 16 and 18. GCSE and A-level time, all a bit tense around here. And I um, work in the NHS. I'm not a nurse or a doctor, so there are other jobs in the NHS. I'm actually an allied healthcare professional um, and an occupational therapist. Now, I understand that <laughs> might not mean much to many people, but just think of it as rehabilitation, enabling independence. You can work in lots of different fields, like in schools, in mental health, in hospitals, but I've chosen generally throughout my career to work in an acute hospital, one of the um, Manchester's major teaching hospitals. And um, at the moment I work in palliative care. So I cover any wards in the hospital where um, obviously inpatients, and usually the patients that I see have got um, sadly life limiting conditions. So everything we do is trying to empower people to have independence through symptom control and um, enabling them to have a quality of life because the one thing we know that we can't change from the NHS side of things is the um, quantity of life. Great and if I could just ask you what was your university experience like? So where did you go and what did you study? Well I've got to cast my mind back so I'm a bit older than some of the other teachers. <laughs> So yeah, back in the day, I went to Exeter University. Um, I actually went to the school, St. Lloyd's School of Occupational Therapy, which sounds like a girl's finishing school. It was affiliated and um, I mean, I'm from Manchester, so it was a long journey, but I think that I wanted to go there if I think back because it had um, a really good reputation at the time. It had the highest number of kind of graduates for that profession. You go in, you train to be an occupational therapist, and that's what you do, it's what you says on the tin. So quite a neat career at the end of it. Um, and one of the reasons I think that I chose to go so far away was to see if I could really be independent. I think particularly with my faith, to tell you the truth. Nice. So how would you describe your relationship with God throughout uni? Um, I would say evolving. So okay. I, yeah, so I came from a Christian family and my dad became a minister or pastor of a church when I was 14, was not cool. Um, <laughs> and I didn't really want to be a pastor's daughter or the minister's kid. And so yeah. I was very good at being in church and part of church and having a really strong Christian family around me. And I think I wanted to go to kind of university to see if I could kind of stand on my own two feet, really, if nice. my faith was going to be my own or not. Um, and during my time at uni, loved it, absolutely loved the people, met loads of different people from different backgrounds, mainly Southerners, actually. So that was interesting for me. Coming from Manchester, they only thought about Coronation Street and soap, so I didn't know anybody <laughs> past Watford. It really was true. And... Um, yeah, I think the main things were that I didn't want to have to kind of come home all the time. So I knew that I couldn't afford to. So it was like really quite far away. And also I knew that I was going to have to find a church possibly on my own where I'd always been really known in the church and a strong church family. And actually I found that super difficult because the course is very much, it was nine to five. Um, and then you would have placements, six placements throughout three years that would be all over the country. So you were kind of constantly moving. So the thing for me that really helped at university was Christian Union and the friends that I found through Christian mm. Union. I don't know, do you even call it that anymore? We do, we do. <laughs> um, not everything's changed then. So yeah, and I think the first two years, I was pretty much kind of continuing with my faith with God, enjoying playing hard, working hard, because it was a really full-on course. 
my husband at the time was doing a humanities degree and he had about six hours a week or something and we were like pretty much nine to five and then on placements where you were being proper grown-ups in mm. like the medical world and stuff and um I think it was my third year where I probably started looking outside my faith not intentionally but actually meeting people with different beliefs and and people who came from different backgrounds. And I'd say that was the year that was probably my most challenging, but probably where I learned most. Great. And how was the transition out of university for you? So was there anything you would have done differently during uni? Um, I think one of the things that was hard for me that I finished my course a little bit later so I went on, like I've mentioned, you have clinical placements and I asked really ambitiously to have a clinical placement down in London at a really mm-hmm. reputable mental health hospital. And actually, in hindsight, I probably wasn't ready for that kind of it's a forensic psychiatry unit. Um, a lot of really challenging patients. I think my background, I think my faith with God wasn't really strong at the time not that he wanted me to go through a bad time because I wasn't close to him but you know just it was a bit of a culture shock and after about Mm. three or four weeks I could find myself losing my confidence and actually I kind of came to a decision where I can carry on that placement which meant that I then had to kind of work harder at the end finish later and um, look for jobs a little bit after some after other people had them so ideally, I would have wanted to stay down south. So my plans kind of changed. Um, and obviously, I finished uni. You've got no money. It was back in the day before loans. So I know that was a privilege for me. So I moved back up north. And um, I got a job in kind of North Manchester way. Um, and I suppose I didn't have as much time to prepare for that because I'd like finished later. But I suppose the thing I want to highlight at that point is that probably that last year at uni taught me about that kind of failure is not the end. And that mm. you know, one, when, when one thing does kind of fall apart, then there's going to be another opportunity. And actually, the place that I had my retake placement at was the place that offered me the job in September. Um, and just thinking of that crossover from uni life, although I was used to placements, to going into the work arena huge huge step so it's like passing your driving test but the learner plates are still on your car but you actually think you know a lot more than you do and I very much if I look back now oh cringe I was probably slightly arrogant with the people who I work with who've been there a lot longer I was full of new ideas I was really ambitious and I think I probably should have listened more to the people around me and um yeah be a little bit more humble (laughs) <laughs> I like that you actually said that because normally people like to think that once they've done uni and they have a degree that's it they know what to do and they just right into the workplace but actually sometimes it can be a slap in the face and yeah. sometimes you need to like take take a while to settle down and just relax yeah, yeah definitely okay. I think really valuing the people that you come to work with particularly people you know, a lot of the unqualified staff in the NHS have been doing the job for years. They kind of know it inside out. And just because they haven't got the professional qualifications, they have got so much life experience and usually really good into personal skills and working, you know, know a way in with patients that I've got all the knowledge, but I might not have the experience of that way in. Yeah, I like that. What would you say your journey was like to the position that you're in now? I would say unexpected. I think one of the things I really want to encourage you to be is just be open-minded. So I mm-hmm. really thought that my career as an occupational therapist would be in mental health. So like I don't know, I've already said that you train in psychology and psychiatry and then medicine and surgery, human biology, which I love because it's a really holistic approach um, and not just in a medical model. But um, I really lent towards mental health throughout all my placements. And that's what I thought I was going to do. And ultimately, I thought I'd be involved in, say, a Christian counselling service or even a kind of safe haven home for people who'd gone through really difficult situations. That was my plan. Um, And I did mental health for 18 months to two years. And I'd say that I pretty much kind of burnt myself out towards the end of it and needed to look for another job that was going to be simpler, where I had a better work-life balance. I'd say at the time there weren't any mentors 
or people that I was getting supervision from either. So I kind of ran away with myself a bit. So the plan A that Caroline Lloyd had to really develop skills in mental health and the mental health setting, I totally changed and went to work at a hospital just on a respiratory ward, then a stroke unit, which I think most of you have heard of people who may have had strokes, sadly. And that's where I ended up at the hospital that I'm at now. And working in brain and spinal cord injury was about 10, 15 years of my career, which I never intended. But do you know what? It was some of the most fulfilling. So I'd always say your plan A, if I'm speaking from my experience, might not be God's plan A. Ooh, I like that. It's really the timing of the situations. So I then think of I did brain and spinal cord injury, which is, I mean, God's creation, the brain, how it regenerates. So these are people who kind of broken their backs or had severe you know trauma to their brain and the ability through different therapy to regenerate is just super exciting and and um, the team that I work with for a good 12 years in a, a brand new neurorehabilitation unit um, was just really really exciting but not anything that I thought I intended um, and then again the shift um, career change because I then had children I wanted to kind of invest in two girls at that point and spending more time with them at home so I went part-time and kind of changed a shift of job again into neurology which actually is people with conditions that can't really be cured and that's probably what kind of sent me in a direction to what I'm doing now which is kind of one of the most fulfilling jobs I've ever done in palliative care but yeah all the way through there's kind of a thread of how God was leading me to the job I'm in now. But was I fully aware of that? No. Did, could I see the bigger picture? No. <laughs> I actually like what you said. That's actually really, I like how you said the plan A that you have might not be God's plan A. I've yeah. never thought of it that way. I've always been like, oh God, why is this yeah. happening? But actually it might have been his plan. So that's yeah. a good one to take away. Um, what would you say are the best and worst parts of your job? So currently now I work with people, like I say, who often have cancer that can't be treated anymore, respiratory conditions, um, heart failure. Basically, there's a limit without a miracle to the life that they're going to lead. And their age ranges are from kind of 30s, 40s, 30s, 70s, 80s, even 90. So obviously, sadness is, is hard. Um, and knowing that people have not kind of had the length of life um, but then the best thing about it is that you're invited to um, help manage symptoms help emotionally support somebody and kind of be part of their life that probably is what one of the hardest times um, and people will open up and share with you things that means that you can kind of help support you know show God's kindness in a way that um I just don't know. I, I can't explain in some ways. It's just that, you know, God had always given me a heart of compassion. We go back to the mental health bit. And I think the training that I did in the psychology and psychiatry that I thought was going to lean to the mental health in palliative care, because you can't just treat someone medically. You know, you give someone bad news and it's not just about have they got pain, have they got nausea, are they not going to be able to walk again? It's that emotional distress. And so that leaning to me, being someone who wants to provide emotional support, kind of understanding we all know that God truly is the person who can give the best, but we need people on the ground, hands and feet, just like slotted me into a role where I was doing physical rehab, but also kind of, we're even asked to kind of look at kind of spirituality in the sense of not just your faith. So faith isn't just spirituality in a palliative care setting, it's what motivates someone what's going to give them purpose, what's going to give them meaning. And, you know, I just get a chance to listen to what pe people are motivated by, try and support them in that with managing their symptoms and kind of bringing families together sometimes to be on the same page as well. So how would you say you deal with the difficulties of working in the palliative care for like the emotional distress? How do you deal with that? You know, I'm going to be really honest. I don't always deal with it really well. So I, I was just saying to um, Zoe just before we before we started that the last three weeks in work have been really challenging. Mm. There's just so many patients and not enough staff. Um, but 
the days when I know that I'm doing it well are the days where I drive in and I pray. And, you know, it sounds simple, but <laughs> simple is good. I pray and I'm just saying, God, what do you want me to do today? Who do you mm. want me to see? So I've got a list of people that I will see from day to day. It's never boring because it's different people, different wards. And even though people's conditions are the same, everyone's personality, family background, other experiences impacts that. So you're never walking into the same situation. And I'd say listening to God is one of the things that helps me most because it's almost like he prepares me sometimes. I, I don't know, really know how to explain that. Having mentors, so I actually have somebody in work who provides supervision for me monthly or every six weeks. Um, she's not a Christian, but the wisdom that she has shared in how to look after myself, how to have boundaries, any of us that are gonna work in healthcare, you've got to choose to make boundaries because you will get burnt out, sorry, otherwise. That kind of, you kind of led into my second question, which was what part does your faith play into all of this? Yeah, I do. Like, yeah, <laughs> kind of touched on it. You want to dip in more? <laughs> I do that in interviews too. Oh, you've answered the next question, sorry. Um, <laughs> prayer, definitely. And I think however much we think we know kind of the Bible and certain verses, just frequently dipping in because the culture, obviously, particularly the last two or three years, a kind of suffering and overwhelmment can really mm. kind of bring you down. And I think God's perspective. And so definitely doing your own kind of studying certain verses. But I've got two or three really close Christian friends that I work with. We're all really open and honest. We kind of share what's going well and what's not going well. We do it informally. We kind of, I've actually got two or three that I work with in the hospital and sometimes we'll just kind of meet up on a corridor and we can just, you know, almost have a like quick pray together. So kind of openness, accountability. And then I just think I've always really challenged about how Jesus dealt with all the needs. And I, I remember doing a talk once on why did Jesus never get people fatigue? Because that's what happens really, we get fatigue. And it's because he was always listening to Father God, wasn't he? He kind of mm. always took himself away and you know, never God. Okay then. Um I just want to like start to like lean to another section now, which is giving advice to students so yeah. what advice would you give to students entering into the medical professions this year I think I'd really say be open-minded like me have a plan but maybe God has got a bigger plan and one that he's not yet say, showing you so I would say have short-term goals so you, you might know what area you want to work in but I'd still say be open-minded God is going to give you the job that fits your abilities and your personality sometimes we can think that he's going to put me in this area and I'm just going to be a good Christian and I'm just going to have to work there and it's going to be hard work but I firmly believe that know what your kind of gifts are know what your strengths and your weaknesses and your personalities are because those will he will show you the job that will work well with that find a mentor find a coach find someone to be accountable to um, and just be honest I just think there can be a culture sometimes where we think because we're fixers, usually those of us who work in the NHS, we've got to look like we've got it all sorted out. We're fixing the patients. And you know what? In the last two or three years, I've probably seen more broken colleagues and, and myself than ever. And we just, you know, we just need to be able to be honest and be vulnerable. And we can do that with God. But I'd say we really need those people alongside us that we can be honest and vulnerable with. And, and those people that can kind of challenge us when we're running away with ourselves, maybe you'll be someone a bit like me, thinks you're superwoman at the beginning and you're going to change the face of the NHS. And I didn't, maybe you will. But yeah, just those people that can kind of, you can be accountable to. Okay, that was really nice. I even listened to you, I was like, oh, that's nice. Um, <laughs> well, okay, what are you most looking forward to about the new kind of kingdom session? You know, I love meeting people. That's why I do the job that I do. So I'm really looking forward to meeting everybody that's going to come. I'm looking forward to hearing their stories, um, hearing what your kind of hopes and dreams are. And just the other thing, I just like, I've been praying about it and thinking about it. I just really feel that God's going to reveal some purposes to you. 
some people already know what their purpose might be. Some people, if you're doing a kind of what I call a straight degree without a kind of specific job at the end of it, I really believe and feel that we're going to hear from God like to direct you and just just encourage you. We all need encouragement, don't we, in what our mm. giftings are. And just, um, yeah, I think just another thing, just hearing Father God's approval because we want to serve God in our workplaces. Okay, then. Um, last question. And is are there any final thoughts that you want to like tell tell us about? Yeah, I think I might have already done them, but I think that the one that um is really coming to mind is that just the verse from Jeremiah. Um, knowing I know you probably all know it. I know the plans that I have for you for hopes and future and good and purpose. And I think that's that's the thing I want to say is that God has got a real purpose for you. And he's going to reveal that and it's going to be a time to encourage and discover together. Okay. Well, thanks guys for watching. Thank you, Caroline, for um, just literally just telling us everything about you and that I'm pretty sure people will be excited to meet you. So thank you. Thank you, Zoe, for being great at questions too. <laughs>